Praise the Lord, church. Can we stand to our feet? We are about to enter a time of worship. I don't know about you, but I came to worship the Lord. Anybody come to worship the Lord this morning? Anybody thankful to be in the house of the Lord this morning? Every hand lifted. I wonder if you can uh, help me pray this morning. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Every hand lifted, every voice lifted. Somebody lift your voice right now. Lord Jesus, I pray that you move in a mighty way, O oh Lord, at the Pentecostals of Katie, O oh Lord. I pray that you work a miracle in this place, O oh mighty God. We dedicate this whole service to you, Lord. Show up in a mighty way this morning. Show off, O oh Lord, in the mighty name of Jesus Christ. I pray, O oh Lord, that you heal every single sickness, O oh Lord. I pray, O oh Lord, that you touch every single life in this place. I wonder if we could clap our hands, all ye people, and shout unto God with the voice of triumph this morning. We worship you, mighty God. Oh, give thanks unto the Lord, for he is good, and his mercy endureth forever. Anybody think of for his mercy, surely mercy and goodness shall follow me all the days of my life. Let's worship with the praise team as we enter the presence of the Lord. Amen. Come on, let's put our hands together. How many are thankful to be in the presence of an almighty God? Amen. And in our trials, we put our trust in you. Standing on your promise, the church shall live by faith. You can do anything when we take the limits of you.
worship you. Come on, all across the building in your own words, could you just lift up your hands and lift up your voices and begin to worship. Begin to worship the God who loved us. Oh, we love you, Jesus, because you first loved us, Lord. We live to worship you, Jesus. To worship you, I live. To worship you, I live. I live to worship you. Come on, can we just sing that all over the house? We were created to worship him. To worship you, I live. Come on, lift your voice. To worship you, I live. from your heart this morning. We worship you, Jesus. To worship you, I live. To worship you, I live. of the Lord is here and where the spirit of the Lord is there is liberty where the spirit of the Lord is there is liberty friend there is an above average chance that the person standing next to you in front of you or behind you 
is fighting a battle that you know nothing about. So before we go back to our seats, I want you to act as a minister. Turn and pray with someone right now. Go ahead. Lay your hands on them. Maybe your husband, your wife, friend, a brother with a brother, a sister with a sister. Right now, in the name that's above every name, let the supernatural power of the Holy Ghost, hallelujah, move into my brother and sister's life. In the name of Jesus, hallelujah, Lord, you can move any mountain. You can heal any sickness. You can right any wrong. And in the name of Jesus, right now, God, move on my brother's hat. Move on my sister's behalf. In the name of Jesus, oh, Pentecostals, let your voice out. Hallelujah. We know it's not by might, not by power, but by my spirit, saith the Lord of hosts. Holy Ghost, do your work right now. In the name of Jesus, we command healing. We command spiritual healing, physical healing. Hallelujah. God, open the windows of heaven right now and bless my brother and my sister. Hallelujah, hallelujah. When you feel the presence of the Lord and you feel the release, why don't you lift your hands, lift your voice, and worship him one more time. Hallelujah, God, I love you. Lord, I worship you. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Oh, somebody make a joyful noise under the Lord this morning. Hallelujah. Aren't you glad it is he that has made us and not we ourselves? Hallelujah. Everything that's good about us comes from Jesus. Praise God. Praise God. Hallelujah. Amen. God bless you. Amen. If you promise to keep worshiping, stay sensitive to the spirit, you can be seated for just a moment. We've got several things we want to share with you today. I'd just like to ask. When you came in this morning, did you see the remarkable progress on our Family Life Center? That's wonderful. Lord willing, amen, supply chain doesn't fail us. We'll be util utilizing that building in November, just a few short months away, amen. This is the Sunday of the month where we share with you updates from our Imagine campaign. If you don't know what that is, that is our building fund program, but it's so much more than that. Our pastor has a vision and our church has adopted it. God is going to add to the Pentecostals of Katy 600 brand new souls over the next three to five years. Now you can see we don't have 600 empty seats in this building. We've got to build and we're not building for ourselves. We're building for the souls that haven't even been invited yet. So we want to share with you an update from our Imagine campaign. And if you would roll that and be prepared to stop because you know I, I, I get hung up sometimes. So, those who've received the baptism of the Holy Ghost in 2021 was 110. This year, we've had 20 receive the Holy Ghost for a grand total of 130 brand new souls, hallelujah, filled with the Holy Ghost. Those were baptized, 89 last year, already 40 this year for a grand total of 129 precious souls baptized in Jesus' name. Amen. First time guests in 2021, 843, what a number. In 2022, 488 for a grand total of 1,331 first-time guests at the Pentecostals. All right, pause it right here. Here's our commitment. $3.6 million is our commitment. For 2021, we collected 575,703. For 2022, thus far, 248,647 for a grand total so far of $824,350. Hallelujah. We're almost to a million dollars, folks. We're almost a third of the way there. Amen. Now, this happens because of your faithfulness to the kingdom of God. Amen. Give and it shall be given. Pressed down, shaken together. Remember your commitment to the Lord and watch God open the windows of heaven for you. Now, each month, we have a specific ministry that we emphasize. This month is small groups. Now, my wife and I, our family have been here going on seven years. And our first, uh, our first impression was they canceled church one Wednesday and that we all have to go to some stranger's house. And, you know, quite honestly, Rob, well, we're not really sure how that's going to work. Friend, small groups will change your life. This is the area, this is the place where you, you make close friends. Now, 
we'll have 600 people or so in service this morning. It's impossible to get to know everybody. But when you become part of a small group, you have close fellowship, you have uh, the ability to pray with one another, you get to know each other on an individual basis, great food, great fellowship, a quick Bible study. And you know what? If you try a small group and you don't like it, maybe they've got too many kids, maybe they don't have enough kids, maybe it's all young people, maybe it's all old people. You're not married to that group. Try a small group. If you don't like it, we'll move you to another one. We have information on our small groups at the desk in the back, but pay attention to this, close, this short video about our small groups this month. Hi, being part of a small group is valuable and important for the growth of our church, whereby friendships and Christian values are humbly exhibited by cheerfully breaking bread together and sharing, encouraging each other in our walk with God. So come and join us for a time of fellowship and good food. With your sacrificial giving, the Imagine Campaign will help us reach new heights to meet the growth of His church. Amen. Um, of some concern to me is both times they showed me in that video I was eating. But hey, that's what small groups are all about. So, amen. God bless you. Thank you again for your faithfulness in giving. We're going to move into a time of our offering, bringing our tithe and offering before the Lord. Our ushers are coming at this time. And if you need an envelope, if you're giving by way of cash or check, uh, in the main service here, you just lift your hand. The ushers will get you an, an offering envelope. Also, several ways to give on the screen behind me. Upcoming this week, 
Vacation Bible School. It's an exciting time at the Pentecostals. We always do it big. Amen. And coming with announcements and details on that, Brother Herb Winslow. God bless you, Brother Winslow. Don't we love Brother Winslow? Oh, yeah. Praise the Lord. In Psalms, it tells us we are fearfully and wonderfully made. In Romans, it tells us that we are worth dying for. In 1 Corinthians, it says we are uniquely gifted, not just gifted, but uniquely gifted. Everybody is gifted differently. In 1 Peter, it says we have a purpose. And in 1 Corinthians, it says your body is perfectly made. And I told our VBS staff, I was like, my body may have been made perfectly, but I messed it up with donuts and cheeseburgers. But when you look at the scripture and it talks about how valuable we are and how God has a purpose for us, but yet somehow, some way, we try to find value in things like money, in things like position, in things like a new car, in things like, you know, just being able to act like somebody else who we think is valuable. But God doesn't see us that way. God sees us valuable from the day we were born because He. He created us with a unique purpose in life, and he sees the value of what that brand new baby is going to do in life, and he knows exactly where he wants that baby to go, who he wants that baby to talk to, and what he wants that baby to do. And when we get the kids here together this week, we are going to teach them that they are created in Christ, and they are designed for a purpose. They don't have to look at the things in the world to try and create their own value, but they are created with a purpose from day one, and God sees them in a very special way. So we're gonna have a blast while we do this all week long from Tuesday through Friday. Kids ages four to 11 are gonna be filling this church and we are gonna be running around the whole thing. We already have about 90 volunteers, so it's pretty amazing. Um, if you wanna volunteer, it's not too late. Come see us at the booth when you uh, leave service today. Uh, but here's the details. So you need to register. If you have a child, you need to register your child. You can do that at the booth. You can do it online. The link is on the POK website. We will be cutting off registration at some point early this week. I'm not quite sure when, but we will um, be cutting it off probably either Monday night or Tuesday afternoon. Uh, so make sure you're registered because after that point when registration's cut off, if you want to bring your kid, you will have to come and stand in line Tuesday night to register, and that line is really, really long, and you do not want to do that. So make sure you register online beforehand. Number two, invite friends, family, neighbors, nieces, nephews, grandkids, whoever you want to. We want to have 5,000 kids in this place, and we couldn't quite fit them, and I think I would go crazy, and I might, like, move away if we had 5,000 kids, but, <laughs> um, but we'd, we'd, we'd try and do it somehow. But anyway... Um, it's going to be a blast. Uh, we do have t-shirts for sale. Not required to have t-shirts. VBS is free, but if you want a, a t-shirt to commemorate this year, we are selling them. They are $15 each or two for $25, and they are also in the foyer. So uh, we're going to have a great time, and make sure you invite all the kids you know in your life. Thank you all. <laughs> Pardon me. Important to know, there's no cost to register your children. All of this is free. It's provided by the church. Bring your kids. Bring your neighbor's kids. Get them registered. Get it Get it done uh, before the deadline uh, this Monday or Tuesday afternoon. A couple of other announcements. Uh, Saturday, June 25th, the ladies' ministry is hosting a bazaar. It will be held here on the campus and just in time to do some spring cleaning. Now, the way that that works is you, you reserve a table. You pay for that space. Well, all of the funds you raise are yours, unless you want to give it to the church. But it's not a, it's not a church fundraiser. This is your opportunity to, to get rid of that stuff. Sell the treadmill you never use. The extra tools uh, you have laying around. I don't have any extra tools. I have tools, but I don't want to get rid of you. Okay. And uh, that nice quilt you made, but you've already had 30. You could come by the booth in the foyer and sign up today. That's the 25th Ladies' Ministry hosting a bazaar. And then tonight... Father's Day Fellowship Service. Praise the Lord. Is there anyone here that enjoys tacos? That, there you go. That's right. Anyone here that enjoys crawfish? All of our Louisiana folks. That's right. Uh, we are going to have both tonight at our service, and here's how it's going to work. All of the fathers get their first plate free. So, Dad, for all you do, 
365 days a year, this one day, someone else is paying for your meal. All right. Everybody else, it's $5 a plate. All right. That includes drinks, all that stuff. $5 per person. That's immediately after service. So we'll have a short fellowship service this evening. Come dress casual because we'll be outside the remainder of the time. All right. So also, we're asking if you have one of those canopy tents that, you know, people set up to do things, we would like to borrow that from you if it's possible. If you could bring that so our cooks and those who are serving aren't just sitting under the sun. So if you've got a canopy tent, see Brother Sal Korea or Sister Pam Korea. Let them know you'll be bringing that. Get it here as soon as you can so we can we can uh, spare our cooks the, the beating of the sun. Also, crawfish plates, taco plates, and let's see, what else am I forgetting? Oh, because of VBS, there's no service this Wednesday night. So no church Wednesday night, vacation Bible school. But mom, dad, your kids are at VBS. You have three date nights. That's right. Praise the Lord. Let's stand together. If you have your offering and your tithe, let's go ahead and lift that to the Lord. And let's pray. Lord Jesus, we love you. We're so thankful for this chance to be in your presence, to be with your people. We ask you to bless both the gift and the giver in Jesus' name. And everyone said amen. 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 When I cannot see, and when I can't take another step, Lord, would you carry me? And when I've lost my fight, will you be my strength? Will you set me a table in the presence of my enemies? I shall not want, I shall not want. Oh, my soul's got a shepherd in the valley, and I shall not walk. I shall not walk. I shall not walk. Cause my cup's running over, running over, and I shall not walk. And I will lift my eyes to where my help comes from. And I won't be afraid of the shadow, cause I've seen the sun. No, I will not stop when the way gets hot. Cause the green only grows in the valley, and that's where you are. I shall not run, I shall not. Oh, my soul's got a shepherd. I shall not, not want. Yeah. I shall not want. Cause my cup's running over. My cup's running over, running over, and I shall not want. Yeah. I got everything that I need. Your goodness and your mercy. You say. I've 
not walk. I shall not walk. Because my soul's got a shepherd in the valley, and I shall not. I shall not walk. I shall not walk. Oh, my cup's running over, running over, and I shall not walk. See, my soul's got a shepherd in my valley, and I shall not want. Yes, my soul's got a shepherd when I'm hurting, and I shall not want. Oh, my soul's got a shepherd when I'm lacking, and I'm not. Oh, my soul's got a shepherd in my valley, and I shall not want. I've got to. I've got mercy, hallelujah, I've got goodness, and I've got My soul's got a shepherd in the valley, and I shall not walk. You shall not walk. You shall not walk. Because your soul's got a shepherd in your valley, and you will not walk. Oh, your soul's got a shepherd in the valley, and I shall not walk. Somebody ought to rejoice in the room. You got a God that cares for your needs. He sees you where you are. He hasn't forgotten you. He hasn't left you. He hasn't left you. He's still by your side, walking with you through fire. Come on, somebody. 
somebody shout. The devil don't mind you coming to church as long as you're quiet. But when the Holy Ghost starts moving, the devil is afraid. I think the devil has sent fear your way long enough. Let's turn the table. Somebody give him a hand of praise in the house. You don't have to have a dead church on a Father's Day. You don't have to have a dead church on a Sunday morning. God can do miracles. God can do signs and wonders right here in your seat today. If you believe it, give him some praise in the house. I feel a touch of the prophetic this morning. There is no spirit of witchcraft. There is no voodoo spirit. There is no demon in hell that can hinder what God wants to do in this house today. You can come with the wrong motive. You can come and try to break in praise, but you cannot stop what the Lord will do in his own house. God will speak in his own house this morning. Give us a praise in the house. Hallelujah. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Somebody say, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. The devils believe and they tremble. Do you believe in one God? Give him some praise. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. You see, I refuse to go to a dead church. I refuse to let the devil dictate how we're going to have service. We're going to give him all of our heart, all of our soul, all of our mind, all of our strength. Praise God. You might as well. You done used your gas money. You done got dressed. You might as well praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Praise God. Oh, yeah, we'll see Father in a minute. But I'm anxious to see that Father. Hallelujah. Praise God. You may be seated. Thank you for being with us at the Pentecostals of Katy, where we are alive and well because he is alive and well. Amen. We want to welcome all of our online guests that are watching around the world. Can we give them a hand? Thank you for watching and worshiping with us. If this is your first or second time with us here at the Pentecostals and you have not yet filled out a guest card, would you raise your hands? We've got ushers that would love to give you one. Here's one. There are some gifts associated with filling out a card, and we want to bless you before you leave. As Pastor says, even if you come to church and you don't like anything about it, you might as well leave with free stuff. Somebody said amen. I'm going to read a few names here in a moment. And if I read your name, if you just raise your hand so we know where you're seated, we're not going to ask you to sing a special or anything. We just want to know where you're at so we can welcome you. We have a couple of uh, special guests with us. The Williams family, where are you at this morning? The Williams family? Okay, these are guests of the Prezes. We also have, amen. I didn't see where they were. Oh, <laughs> uh, Micah and Bella Rodriguez, where are you at this morning? Huh? Okay, there they are. <laughs> Can't see up here, okay. And then we have Brown, uh, Delvin, Brittany, and uh, the Brittany family. Are you here this morning? God bless you. All right. Amen. Amen. Well, why don't we all stand? We're going to put five minutes on the clock. Now, if you're a part of the youth, you're staying in service today. Only the preteens are going to be dismissed. Also, I want to note that uh, brother and sister Cheston Seagraves, this is their first service back as a married couple. Glad to have them with us today. And also, brother and sister Hunter Dobson, glad to have you with us today. Amen. Praise God. All right. So we got five minutes on the clock. All right. Why don't we mingle and shake one another's hands? God bless you and be friendly. We'll meet you back in five minutes.
somebody near you and say he's good to me he's my everything amen 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 we're going to go to the word of the lord in the book of haggai chapter one while you're turning there i want to say on behalf of our senior pastor and all of our leaders and ministers at the church thank you all of our guests for being with us today we do miss our pastor pastor mckee and his family they have been away on vacation they're on their way back now they will be here tonight and uh, we're looking forward to having a great time tonight. Again, it is a fellowship service, so we'll have a service here. It'll be a shorter version than the typical Sunday night service. And then outside will be eating crawfish and tacos. So you want to come dress or uh, <laughs> you want to come dress for eating some crawfish. You know that can get a little messy and uh, be outside, but we'll have a great time. Looking forward to it. Congratulations. Uh, and give honor today to all of our fathers. Happy Father's Day to all of our fathers. Amen. God bless you. Again, we'll be dealing more with that in the seeming service as we honor all of our fathers tonight. Amen. The book of Haggai, chapter 1, and verse 2. Thus speaketh the Lord of hosts, saying, This people say, The time has not come, the time that the Lord's house should be built. Then came the word of the Lord by Haggai the prophet, saying, Is it time for you, O ye, to dwell in your sealed houses, and this house lie waste? Now therefore, thus saith the Lord of hosts, Consider your ways. 
you have sown much and bring in little. <clears throat> you eat, but ye have not enough. Ye dream, but ye are not filled with drink. Ye clothe you, but there is none warm. And he that earneth wages, earneth wages to put it into a bag full of holes, or a bag with holes. Thus saith the Lord of hosts, consider your ways. Haggai chapter 2, reading verse 18, consider now from this day and upward, from the fourth and twentieth day of the ninth month, even from the day that the foundation of the Lord's temple was laid, consider it. Is the seed yet in the barn? Yea, as yet the vine and the fig tree, and the pomegranate and the olive tree hath not brought forth. From this day will I bless you. Amen. We read here in Haggai chapter 1 a portion of a prophecy given by the Lord through the, the prophet Haggai. The Lord is bringing correction. He says that you lack, and the reason that you lack is because it is time to build my house, but you're not building it. Then in chapter 2, we read a portion of another prophecy from Haggai. The Lord is saying, from this day will I bless you. I want you, by the help of the Lord, to speak, to speak on this subject today, the way to abundant blessing, the way to abundant blessing. Jesus, I thank you for your word. God, I pray that you help me today. God, help my call. I give you the praise and glory. Help me, God, to be able to convey what you have given to me to share with your people. In Jesus' name, everyone say amen. Amen. You may be seated. I've been traveling some here and there, and of course, my sinuses seem to be an ongoing issue, and this has been about four or five weeks of this now, and it's much better today than it has been the last uh, several weeks. The last couple of days has been better, but um, as you see, I'm not putting bubble gum in my mouth. I'm putting a cough drop. I had a cough drop in my mouth one time a couple years ago when someone came up to me afterwards and said something along the lines, I'm disappointed that you'd be in the pulpit chewing bubble gum. And I said, I only wish. I said, that was a cough drop. Next to um, Obadiah, the book of uh, Haggai <coughs> is the shortest book in the Old Testament. It only contains two chapters, and it consists of 38 verses. This is much shorter than uh, Psalms 119, for sure. In these uh, 38 verses, there are four prophecies that are given. Uh, three of them are given to Judah, and one of them is given to the governor, uh, which was Zerubbabel. Uh, very interesting is the fact that these prophecies took place over 2,500 years ago, and yet, and I find this to be astonishing, we actually know the day that they took place, the very day. The first prophecy took place during the second year of the reign of King Darius, which would have been 520 B.C., occurred in the sixth month and the first day of the sixth month, which by our modern calendar would have been August the 29th of, two, of, of 520 B.C. The second message begins in chapter 2, verse 1. It took place just a couple months later on October the 17th. And then the third and fourth messages were given on the same day, which was December the 18th of 520 B.C., one was given to Judah, and the other one was given to the governor of Zerubbabel. And the context is such that the, the, the nation, God's people, the Jews, Judah had returned from exile in Babylon in 538 B.C. And so that means that they are now, at the time of these prophecies, they have been living in Jerusalem for 18 years. And this is a big deal because as we begin to see here in the scripture, for 18 years, the temple had remained unbuilt. It had, it, they had not rebuilt it yet. They had not gotten involved in, in, in working. And we'll find there was a portion of a time, but then they had stopped. And so 
years have gone by and nothing has been taking place in the rebuilding of this temple. And there are various reasons of why that they had not rebuilt the temple. Uh, some speculate that it could be because the original prophecy was that they would be in captivity for 70 years and then would return to rebuild the temple. And at the time uh, at which captivity actually started, that would have been in 586 B.C. And so only 66 years had passed as opposed to the 70 that had been prophesied. But if you consider the time of the affliction, the first invasion of Nebuchadnezzar, which took place in 605 B.C., then we're a few years past the 70 years of prophecy. Another possible reason was because of the opposition that they faced from the local population, which were the Samaritans, a large part of them were Samaritans. Uh, another one was that they lacked the resources. They were sowing, but they were bringing in very little. They were working hard, but they had little to show for it. So the timing just didn't seem to be right. They needed to wait for a better time to rebuild the temple. And again, it wasn't that the people hadn't started uh, rebuilding. Upon their return in 538, they had tried to rebuild the temple, but lacking resources, they just had stopped. And, but that wasn't the only challenge. Um, history shows that shortly after uh, King Darius ascended the throne, that war broke out in uh, many sections of the empire, and it took two years for peace to be restored. So when you look at all of these factors, it becomes evident that the conditions of the day, at least from human reasoning or human thinking, the conditions of the day was as such that it didn't seem that though this was the most favorable time to rebuild the temple. And so human reasoning, human thinking, um, it made sense just to wait until everything was right, and then we will get involved in rebuilding the temple. But Haggai, he begins his message, and this is a prophetic word from the Lord. It was a word of correction. Sometimes we think prophetic words are just, you know, hey, God's going to bless you. And I have a prophetic word for you that, you know, everything is going to work out great for you, and you're going to be wealthy and all these things. But a prophetic word many times in scripture was a, a very strong word of correction. And so Haggai, he delivers this, this word of correction from the Lord and he begins by saying uh, in a question, is it time for you yourselves to be living in paneled houses while this house remains ruined? Now, the King James uses the word sealed um, panels and, and or here it, the word sealed uh, houses, but the word translated would be like panel houses. So this is some type of wood, or perhaps um, they say that in the, those days it could have been some form of a plaster. Uh, the point was, was that they had taken uh, some measures to make sure that their homes were homes of, of comfort. And so their homes were homes that they had been working on during this time of, after return in 538, and they made sure that their homes were, their, they, they were well uh, situated to, to enjoy. And uh, they, they had nice walls. And, and so the Lord is speaking through the prophet, and he says that is it time for you to be living in your house, your paneled houses, while my house remains ruined? Uh, he, he wasn't having all of their excuses or all of their reasons why they had yet to move forward and rebuild the temple. The Lord, he, he just wasn't, it, it wasn't resonating. It wasn't like uh, adding up in the way that God looks at things. It was only adding up in the way that we as humans would look at things. And, and so he, he focuses on their lean harvest. And this lean harvest uh, wasn't just something that had happened this one particular year, but this had been year after year. It was a reoccurring pattern. It was a vicious cycle. And you would have to, in a harvest, you'd have to keep back some of the seed so that you could plant it and have uh, a harvest the next year. 
And so when the harvest was small, uh, what you had to kept, keep back, um, it, it ate into what you had left over. And then you would do that the next year, and then again, it was a lean harvest, and it was as though that there was a dwindling supply because you, you had to keep back to plant for the next year. And now you're thinking, man, i got to keep more back than I kept the previous year because, you know, the harvest was so lean, and so we have to uh, sow more. And this was a vicious cycle. So it was a desperate situation that the people were finding themselves in. Uh, he, he said that, that there's some disease uh, among you because it refers to that the quantities uh, of food are failing to satisfy your needs. In other words, your metabolism somehow does not properly uh, allow the, this food to be digested and, and for you to be healthy and strong and well. And then there's the fact that the wine uh, it failed to provide the satisfaction it normally would have provided. And then, and then there was the fact that their clothes were not sufficiently heavy enough to keep uh, the winter's damp chill out and, and keep them warm. And so the message that Haggai delivered to the people was that these types of hardships had fallen on them because they had not included the Lord in their plans, but instead... They were preoccupied with their own interests. Now, if you, if you stop and you read this and you, you take time to, to think about what you <coughs> are reading, you would, you would have to ask the question, why was God so interested in the rebuilding of this temple? Why, why, would, why would it matter? I mean, we, we've come back from... Exile, we, we are trying to get our lives back together. We're trying to make sure everything is set up right for us. Why would God be interested in the rebuilding of this temple right now? I mean, you know, we, we could offer sacrifices in a, in a makeshift um, altar. We, we could, um, you know, carry out worship in, in, in a different place. Why this temple? Well, the answer is because God's reputation was at stake. Now, this is an important point. God could not be properly honored as long as his plans and his purpose lay in ruins. Now, I'm going to say this again. God could not be properly honored. He could not be properly glorified as long as this temple lay in ruins because the temple illustrated or symbolized God's plan and God's purpose and as long as it lay in ruins, then God was not glorified. God was not seen by others as being the great God that he was. He was not seen as the God who had provided, as the God who had come through, as the God who made all things come together and work together for good. He could not be seen as that God because the people were not moving forward in the rebuilding of the temple. They were not moving forward in fulfilling God's plan and God's purpose. So God could not be properly honored. It, it suggested to those that were looking at what was taking place, a place in Jerusalem from the outside. It suggested to them that, well, God isn't able or that God, um, you know, that, that, that temple thing really wasn't that big of a, of a deal. It, it really wasn't as important as what they had proclaimed it to be. So as long as the temple remained in ruin... It served as evidence to those around them that, you know what, God cannot be trusted. He's not worthy of being trusted. And those people, you also could say this, that those people do not fully trust their God. So God was very intent in making sure that this temple was rebuilt and because God was so focused on the purpose and so intent in this purpose, uh, God made sure that he held back blessings to his people until his people got in alignment with his will. Now, you could argue that, well, they had houses uh, of nice walls. They, 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 they spent time on that. And you could argue that in, in the midst of, uh, of a crazy world around them, uh, there would have been the, the fighting and, 
and, and all that going on in the empire, but, you know, they were blessed. You could argue that, well, you know, they, they had been in captivity for many years, and now they're back there. That's got to be a blessing. But you'll find that in, in what was going on in their world at that time, what they were experiencing was actually a direct result of their lack of alignment with God's plan and God's will in their life. They needed to finish the task of rebuilding the temple in order to show their devotion to God and to show that they were putting God first in their life. And God says the reason why you are lacking, the reason why you're not being blessed as you could be blessed, is because of your failure to put me first. Now, now this, is not, this is not all, but I want you to think about this just for a second. How you guys' message implied that if they were to put God first, not only would they have more money in their bags, because right now their bags have got holes, not only wear their clothes uh, give, give warmth, not only, in other words, not only would God stop this, this you know, lack of blessing them, but instead it applies that if you put God first, they would have experienced an increase in money and that they would have ended up with even better clothes and they wouldn't have gotten as sick as often. So the reason why the harvest was poor because each man was busy with his own house and the reason why they were lacking is because they were putting themselves first and the reason why their, their money seemed to disappear was because they were putting it into the bags of holes. It didn't last. It didn't go as far as it should have gone. If they had put God first, if they had, had, had put God's will and fulfilled his plan and his purpose, then God would have opened up the windows of heaven and he would have poured a biblical a principle that we'll find here in a moment. He would pour blessing out upon them. Malachi 3 and 10 says it like this. Bring all the tithes into the storehouse that there may be food in my house. And try me now in this, saith the Lord of hosts, if I will not open for you the windows of heaven and pour out for you such a blessing that there will not be room enough to receive it. The principle is as such that it's not just about you stopping the loss of things, but it's really about God closing that door of loss and God opening up a door of blessing. And when it's all said and done, you end up with a greater blessing than you could ever imagine. So we, I have been preaching this recently, and I, I, I can't get away from it. I've been, I preached it here. I preached it elsewhere. It's just in my spirit. And I, I made mention of, uh, of Elijah where that he goes and he finds this widow woman in Zarephath. And he says, bake me a cake. She's already received a word from the Lord. You are to bake this prophet a cake. The Bible says that. He says, when you get there, I've already commanded her. I've already commanded her. And so he gets there and she says, well, I don't have, I don't have enough. I, I've, just, I, I, I've got enough for just one last cake. And the prophet Elijah says, well, if you go and bake that cake and give it to me, you'll, you'll have enough for you and your son. And sure enough, she ends up enough for her and her son. But then God turns around and there's enough in the barrel every day and enough in the, 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 the vessel of oil every day. So flour and oil to sustain her and her son throughout the entire famine. God says, I'll give you your miracle that you need right now, but then I will give you more. I'll bless you abundantly. It's not just with the Elijah, but Elisha comes along and there's a widow woman who has two sons and she owes a great debt to the creditors. They're coming to take her sons away. And, and she goes to the prophet and she goes, I, I, need, I need help. I, I need something. And he goes, well, what do you have? He goes, I got just a little bit of oil. And he says, well, go get all the empty vessels in the community, bring them in here and take that little bit of oil that you've got and pour it out. And she did. He goes, now go and sell all of that and pay your debtor. And so she did. She went and she paid the person that she owed debt to and the Bible says that she had enough left over that it sustained her and her sons the rest of their lives. 
See, we, we, we look at things sometimes, and we are, human reasoning, we are looking at, and we're going like one plus one equals two, but God says one plus one equals ten. We look at it and we say one minus one means zero. That means if I give this away, then I'm somehow, it's not going to return. But God says, if you'll give me the 10%, you keep the 90, I'll take the 10% and I'll pour out a blessing upon you that you cannot even contain. See, God's math is different than our math. God's ways are different than our ways. We think that in order to get more, I got to keep more. But God says the way to get more is to give more. <laughs> Hallelujah. Uh, amen. Someone say amen. amen. I talked to a businessman some years ago. He said, I have learned, he said, that I cannot outgive God. And at the time, he said, I am right now giving 40%, 40% in offering and tithe. He said, I started this years ago when I started a business. He said, I tithe. He said, I tithe, personally, I tithe on my business. And he said, I started giving. He said, and my business grew and it increased. And he said, and every time I up at 10%, he said, more blessings pour in. More blessings pour in. More blessings pour in. He said, I'm now up to giving 40%. He said, and God keeps on blessing me. This is a biblical principle. When you put God first in your life, when you say, God, I'm going to align with your plan, your purpose for my life, for my family. I'm putting you first. When you do that, God pours out blessings upon you. This is a biblical principle. Amen. Can someone say amen. So Haggai says in verse 8, go up, bring down, and build. Go up to the mountain and bring wood and build the house. In other words, you can't just sit back and say, God's going to bless me. And then something happened. You got to get involved in the process. You got to do something. It's going to require some work. It's going to require some effort. Go up, bring down, and build. You're going to have to do something. And when you do, God adds, I will take pleasure in it and I will be glorified. I think this is so interesting. See, the, 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 the picture of what God is actually doing in our lives is much bigger than what we think. You fulfilling God's plan and God's purpose for your life is bigger than what you think. You moving forward with what God has already set in motion is bigger than what you think. You going up and bringing down and building is bigger than what you think. Because when you move forward in God's plan and God's purpose and you begin to go up, bring down and build, God says, I will be glorified. I will be glorified. Come on, somebody. You can't glorify God by not doing anything. It doesn't work that way. You can't say that, oh, God be glorified and then not do anything. It doesn't work. But when you get involved and you go up and you bring down and you begin to build, God says, you know what, I'll step in, I'll do something right now because now they're glorifying me. Now they show that they trust me. Now they're moving forward despite the lack of resources. Now they're moving forward despite the lack of everything coming together, everything looking right. The timing doesn't look right, but they're moving forward. So therefore, I will be glorified. <laughs> Hallelujah. It's like I got to come down here and wake some of you up. We, we think sometimes that, well, when I get everything together, when everything makes sense, when, when the economy gets to where it needs to be, and I get an X amount in my bank account, and my resources are all just right, then I will put God first. But God's not glorified when you do all that. God's glorified when you step in, when God is able to step right into a mess and say, you know what, I'll pour out blessing upon you, I'll bring this together, that together, I'll make it happen. And everyone around you will know that it was me that did all of this. I, 
I, I, don't, I don't get it. I don't, I don't get it how it is that, that we as people think that somehow that we're smarter than God. I don't get how we think that our ways are better than his ways. I don't get how that we're able to take God and his word and push it aside because we are dealing with reality. I've been there. I've been there. I remember looking at all the bills on the table. We were moving forward. God said, move forward. We were moving forward, and I'm looking at all the bills on the table, and I'm thinking, I don't know how in the world we're supposed to move forward. I don't even know how to even pay all these bills. And my wife walked around the corner in the kitchen. This was a decade or so ago. She walked around the corner in the kitchen, and she says, what are you doing? I said, I'm trying to figure out how to make all this work. And she said, uh, she said well, I'll tell you how it all works. She said, we're just going to have faith in God. Ticked me off. See, I, I'm, I'm a man. I'm, I'm a man. And, and, and as a man, I want to make everything work. I, I feel like I've got to have the answers. I've got to pull it together. I've got to take care of my family. I've got to provide. I've got to be the one. I, I, it's me. I, I'm, I'm, I'm the head of the house. I've got to make this happen. And I'm looking at all that. And my wife just says, well, just trust God. And I just kind of felt like it was one of those little statements like, well, you know what? Just do whatever you want to do and trust God. Now, I know, I found out in 24 hours, that's not what she was meaning. She wasn't saying like, well, you know, well, we just trust God. And then you go out and you just buy all kinds of stuff and you're not a good steward. That's not what she was saying. She was just saying that we were at a place right in our life that God was saying move forward. It didn't make sense to move forward. All the resources, none of it was coming together. It didn't make sense. And yet she was saying, have faith in God. And I replied, Brother Smith, I thought it was wisdom. I turned around. I said, faith does not deny reality. And if you all know Carrie, she just kind of did her lips like, which means that I'm not saying anything right now, but I got something to say, and I will say it at some point. <laughs> she just closed her lips, and she went on her way, and I thought, I took care of that one. <laughs> but I believe in the faith, but you got to deal with reality, too. You know, the reality is this, and the reality is that, and the reality is this, and the reality is that. And man, I'm telling you what, you can talk about faith all you want, but this is the reality. But the deal is, is that God had already spoken that it was time for us to move forward. And we were moving out, following God, and then it seemed as though that, man, none of this is making sense. It's how can this come together? What, what can we do? Uh, we, we don't know what to do. And the next morning, I'll never forget it, she's standing at the foot of the bed when I opened up my eyes. I'm laying on my back, and I looked up, and she was standing at the foot of the bed, and the, at the bed, and the first thing I heard out of her mouth was, and with her finger pointing at me, she said, you go ahead and hold on to reality. I'm going to hold on to faith in God. I got a question for somebody here today. Are you going to hold on to reality, or are you going to hold on to faith in God? Are you going to hold on to the word that God has given you, or are you going to hold on to reality? Are you going to look at what the doctor said, or are you going to look at what the word of God says? Are you going to listen to what the economy is saying, what the forecasters are saying, what everything around the world is saying to you? Are you going to look at your resources? Or are you going to look to God who has already spoken to you, put visions and dreams and callings in your life? Are you saying, I got to wait until the timing is right? No, this is not about reality. This is about your faith. God is not glorified. As long as you hold on to reality, God is glorified when you walk by faith. Let me just tell you, this Friday I just concluded a deal that I've been working on for five months to acquire my second largest competitor in the entire Houston market. Maybe you think that those kind of things just happen naturally. Maybe you think, well, that's not a real big deal. Can I tell you that everything that I have all, it, it, all of it has come from learning how to give to God sacrificially and put God first. This Friday, we bought one of the longest term hardscape businesses in the Houston market, took over their entire operation. God opened the door five months ago. Brooke and I walked through it on this Friday. God has blessed us abundantly. Can I tell you today, it has not come. It has not come by coming to church and sitting on a pew. I don't care how much money you've got. I don't care how much 
talent and abilities you've got, if you're not investing them in the kingdom, God will not bless it. It doesn't matter how much you've got. If you're not putting your money in the kingdom, God will not continue to bless you. I want you to understand today that God has blessed this church with you. God has put you here for such a time as this. God has planted you and your families and your talents and your abilities here. But can I tell you, we will never see 600 souls. We'll never build another auditorium until you learn to invest in the kingdom of God first. It's not first your desires. It's first the kingdom. It's not what you want. It's not your house. It's God's house. It's not what you want. It's what God wants to do through you. Seek ye first the kingdom of God. I believe without a shadow of a doubt that God is trying to pull this church out of the realm of reality that we are living in into a realm of faith where we can put our money and our talents and our abilities in the kingdom of God and say, God, I've got other things to do, but this is the most important. God, I've got other needs and desires to put my money to, but God is first the kingdom. I've come to tell you today that if you'll start op- start operating in that element of faith. God will bless your finances. God will open doors in business. God will open doors in ministry. But you've got to keep him first. Hallelujah. 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 Why don't you jump to your feet and give God glory and honor and praise right now. Glorify the name of the Lord. Hallelujah. 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 God cannot be glorified while we sit and do nothing. God is glorified when we move forward. We bring down and we build. Hallelujah. And I'm not talking about just building a building. If you've limited your thinking, oh, you're trying to get more money. This is all about money today. We're trying to build a building. Then you've missed out on the message of what we're talking about here today. We're talking about that God wants to bless you. God wants to bless you abundantly, but his way to blessing you abundantly is not for you to sit back and do nothing so that he's not glorified, but it's for you to move forward in what God has already given you, the word that God has given you, the promise that God has given you, the dream that God has given you, the vision that God has given you. When you move forward, God says, I'm glorified. Hallelujah. Amen. Music come. I'm going to come to a quick close here. You may be seated just for a moment. You think, well, if I had this and if I had that, then I could put God's plan and purpose first. But your failure to put him first is what costs you. God says in verse 9, he says, you brought it home. You went out and worked. You did all this. He said, but I, whew, I blew it away. He says, I called for drought. He says, because of you, the heavens have withheld their dew and the earth its crops. He says, the labor of your hands isn't being blessed because I'm not blessing what you are doing. But when you start putting God first, amen. Verse 12 records the positive reaction of the people. It says that the people obeyed and feared the Lord and then they began to work on the temple. But in closing, I want you to catch this. The ultimate blessing wasn't just about them building the temple. Haggai's second prophecy, the second prophecy, it begins in chapter 2, verse 1. It begins by asking the people three questions. Who was left among you who saw this temple in its former glory? How do you now see it? And how does it not seem to you as though that it doesn't even compare. In other words, some of you, this is 70 years, some of you, and they, commentators believe that perhaps even Haggai himself, have vivid memories of the former temple that Solomon had built. And they knew its glory. They knew its splendor. And here they are, all these years later, trying to rebuild this temple And there was no way that this temple was going to look anything like the former. 
It wasn't going to measure up. But I love this. Haggai 2 and 9. The Lord of hosts declares that the later glory of this house will be greater than the former. It, 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 it doesn't look like it. God says, no, no, you don't understand. This house is going to have more glory than the former one. That doesn't seem possible. How could this, this temple be greater than the former? Well, for one, it was going to be this temple that they're going to rebuild that Jesus was going to step into. Mm, my Lord. My Lord. I want, you, I want you to think about this here for just a second. This temple, the second one, they're rebuilding. Doesn't look anything like the first one. Doesn't seem to measure up. But God says that this temple is going to receive greater glory. Why? Because God himself, manifest in flesh, was going to walk into this temple. In other words, what you're involved in right now is much bigger and greater than what you think. You're looking at it right now and thinking this temple right here doesn't measure up to this one it doesn't look as great doesn't look as grand but God says you know what I'll step in and when I get done with it it's gonna be greater than what you could ever imagine it's gonna go far beyond what you could ever conceive what you are looking at in your life right now may not look like everything that God promised you but you hold on because when you go up and you bring down and you build, God says, I'll be glorified. I'll show up. God is going to blow your mind. He's going to do greater works than you could have ever imagined. And the reason why is not because of your labor. It's not because that you were able to build some great thing, that you were able to do some great thing in yourself. It's not about that. It's about his glory. It's about his glory. Hallelujah. I need some victory music. That put that right there is making me depressed. There we go. Come on now, son. I pick on my boy. That's my boy. God says that you're going to go back and you're going to work. I get it. I get that what you are laboring in right now doesn't look like it's going to measure up. It's not going to be some great deal. It's not going to really matter. It's, it's just, it's less than, and you know, and, and, and man, back then, look what they did. Look what they were able to do. Look at what they were able to put together. But God says, you know what? If you'll do what I've told you to do, if you'll follow me, if you'll move out, if you'll go up, bring down and build, then I will show up. I'll be glorified. And when it's all said and done, it's going to be greater than the former. Hallelujah. It's going to be greater than the former. Let, 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 let me say it like this. Let me say it like this. Remain standing. Let me say it like this. Some of you are adding things up and you're looking at everything. You're surveying everything. And you're adding it all up, and in human reasoning, you're looking at it, and you're going like, man, it's just not going to be what it really should be. I know I can move forward. I know I can go build. I know I can go put forth the effort. I know I can do all these things. But e e even when I do that, it's just not going to be what, you know, what I feel like I was promised. It's, not gonna, it's, it's just not going to measure up. But the deal is, is that when God shows up, God is glorified. And when God is glorified, it's always bigger. It's always greater than what you could ever imagine. God, I'm looking at people right now that I know some of your stories. I know the amount of money you could be making, and I know the sacrifice that you've made to do what you are doing right now. But God says that because you have followed me, because you have aligned yourself with my plan and my purpose, I'll take care of all of that. But when it's all said and done, I will be glorified, and I will do a greater work, the greater things is coming out of all this than what you could ever imagine. It's the way of abundant blessing.
he says, the Lord of hosts declares that the later glory of this house will be greater than the former, and in this place, I will give peace. That wasn't even going to happen when Jesus stepped into the temple. That's not even happened yet. That's going to happen. They are rebuilding a temple over 2,500 years ago, and God is speaking to them, saying that when it's all said and done, what you're doing right now is going to be far greater than you could ever imagine. I want to tell somebody here today, God's got something bigger in store for you than you can imagine. It's greater than you can fathom. You need to trust him. Go up, bring down, build, put God first, his plans first, his purpose first, and then watch what God does. Hallelujah. I know the economy's bad. I know the gas prices are high. I know you're trying to figure everything out. I know it doesn't seem to make sense. But if God has spoken to you and God is saying, yes, my hand is on you. This is my plan. This is my will for your life. Follow me. Trust me. Listen to my voice. Put me first every day of your life. Put me first when you get up in the morning. Before you turn on the news and start listening to the reports of the news, turn into my Bible. Turn into my word. Align yourself with my word. Because my word is greater than the report that you're getting from the newscast. My word is greater than the report that you get from the doctor. My, my, my word is greater than the report that you get from your discussions with one another. My word is greater. It's greater. It's greater. Align yourself with my word. Align yourself with the vision I've given you. And everything that you need is wrapped up in that vision. It's wrapped up in that word. Trust me. Trust me, says God. Will I not open up the windows of heaven and pour out a blessing on you that you cannot contain? Hallelujah. If you feel that way today, that God is encouraging you, you know, hey, I'm going to follow him. I'm going to trust him. I want you to step out where you're at right now. Walk down this altar. Lift your hands and start glorifying God. Make up your mind. I'm not just going to glorify him even right now in my singing and in my words of affirmation. But God, I'm going to glorify you in my actions. I'm going to glorify you tomorrow. The next day, I'm going to go up. I'm going to bring down and I'm going to build. I'm going to align myself with your will. I'm going to align myself with your plan. Hallelujah. If you need the baptism of the Holy Ghost here today, you never received the Holy Ghost with the evidence of speaking in other tongues. Walk right down here to this altar. God will fill you with the baptism of the Holy Ghost. You've never been baptized in Jesus' name. We'll baptize you today. Nothing like being baptized in Jesus' name. Just walk right over here to the left. We'll baptize you in Jesus' name. Hallelujah. God, you've given me a promise. You've given me a promise. Lift your hands to heaven. You've given me a promise. You've given me a word. You've given me a vision. You've spoken into my life. You've placed your hand on me. You have called me. God, I align myself with that calling. God, I'm not going to look at the stock market and to make my decisions. God, I'm not focused on the economy and making my decisions. God, I'm listening to your voice. I'm putting you first. I'm trusting you. God, you own the cattle on a thousand hills. God, you have all the gold. All the silver is yours. God, there's nothing that you cannot do. Nothing outside of your hand. Nothing outside of your control. So God, I trust you. I trust you. I trust you. I trust you. I'll trust you in my decision. I'll trust you by moving forward. I'll build. I'll build. I'll do what you call me to do. Hallelujah.
we heard this morning from Dr. Wilson? How many of you are thankful for the word of the Lord that we heard this morning? I want to tell you that before we dismiss today, with greater sacrifice comes greater blessing. There also comes greater expectation the greater the blessing gets. I challenge you today that if God opens the door of blessing for you, if God answers the prayer that you prayed today in this place, God opens doors of opportunity and God does miracles, don't let it affect your faithfulness. In fact, I challenge you to as he blesses you more, you get involved more. You find another ministry. You find another way to serve. You find another way to give. You find something else greater to do because that is God's plan for you when he blesses you. Amen? Amen. Quick reminder that tonight we will have crawfish and tacos. Quick abbreviated service, dress casual. We're going to have a great time. I'm excited about what's going to happen in this place. Casual dress, not casual worship. We're going to have a move of the Holy Ghost here in this place tonight. Come expecting that. It's going to be a great time. But let's close today in prayer. Let's lift our hands one more time and ask that God would go with us. Jesus, God, we thank you for your word today. God, help us to do, God, what has been preached to us today. God, we ask you today, God, that you would let your word get a hold of our hearts and our minds and our actions, Jesus. God, go with us today. Let your hand of protection be upon us and bring us back here safely tonight. And everybody said in Jesus' name. God bless you. You are dismissed. We will see you tonight at 6 p.m. for crawfish and tacos.
I'm not turning back now. Ha! 